Excellent. I'll look to you to kick us off. Um, yeah, sure. So welcome everybody and thank you for facilitating today's forum, Jen. I appreciate it. This is uh, an opportunity. I think this is our, our third public opportunity for the public to hear sort of the general overview of the budget as well as uh, have an opportunity to address council with any concerns or priorities or issues that the public would like to share with us. I look forward, as do my colleagues, to hearing everybody's perspectives about how we can move the city forward, given the financial outlook for the coming year, which Director Grew will explain shortly, our budget director, um, and the expiration, of course, of some of the one-time only dollars that we reserved from the federal rescue plan. Council has to consider how to reallocate funding for existing programs and projects in order to balance the budget. In other words, this is, this is a very, very tight and tough budget for city council. As we deliberate on how to allocate funds for this particular budget cycle, the council is going to have to do uh, a number of things simultaneously. First, we're going to have to support the system changes that are required to implement the charter changes approved by the voters last November. And I'm pleased to say that work is well underway and it's going very well. Secondly, we'll have to continue to address priority issues like Portland's chronic rate of homelessness and improving safety community within uh, Portland. Uh, this is work that... Uh, uh, I've highlighted requires significant staff time as well as investment. Over the course of the next of the, the course of the last several budget cycles, I feel confident this council laid a solid foundation to facilitate an incredible amount of change that's taking place. We've aligned bureaus into service areas to improve service delivery. We're standing up community advisory bodies to guide the charter implementation. And we've contracted change management and engagement firms to facilitate the transition from our current form of government, our commission form of government, to the new form of government. The $27 million that City Council allocated during the fall budget monitoring process has kick-started the development of our temporary alternative shelter sites across the city. And I'm very pleased with the strength of the partnership we have with the governor, as well as the county chair. We believe this model will better connect homeless individuals to services that they need to help them get off and stay off the street. That includes behavioral health uh, uh, services, uh, substance use disorder treatment services, navigation to housing, basic medical services, and the like. My office continues to work with Multnomah County to identify uh, the totality of these critical services for the sites, and we're continuing to call upon both our state and our federal partners for additional funding and support. I'm also working closely with the Portland Police Bureau to support their strong recruitment efforts for sworn officer positions. Uh, just uh, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, we welcomed 15 new officers to the ranks. The Portland Police Bureau is leading the way in terms of recruiting new officers as You'll recall a little over a year ago, I pledged we would hire 300 additional police personnel over three years. We're now actually ahead of uh, that, uh, that goal. And so we're excited about that. Our community safety division in partnership with other public safety partners and nonprofits is leading work to reduce gun violence. I'm hopeful that the recent decrease in overall gun violence incidents continues. Finally, I recognize the impact that these critical issues have on neighborhoods, and I continue to advocate for funding towards basic livability issues, litter collection, graffiti abatement, uh, business district lighting, and other services. The fiscal year 23-24 budget is going to continue to build upon the foundation that this council has already put into place, and I'll continue to press for important initiatives and investments in those targeted areas of homelessness, uh, public safety, livability related issues, and of course, our city's economic recovery. I look forward to hearing from everyone today. Jen, I really appreciate your facilitation of this effort and I'll turn it over to you. Oh, uh, Commissioner Ryan asked me to read a statement. Maybe I'll do that right now before I forget if, if my colleagues will, will allow that. I see thumbs up. Uh, so Commissioner Ryan is unable to attend today 
due to a family funeral, but his staff is here in attendance and uh, they, like the rest of the council, are eager to hear from you. Uh, Commissioner Ryan is grateful to all who are participating in today's community listening session, and he asked that I share the following statement on his behalf. As you all know, we're in a time of historic transition. Portland City Commissioners were given new assignments in January. Service area clusters of bureaus, offices, and programs, all of which are uniquely interconnected. My, meaning Commissioner Ryan's, service area focus is culture and livability. It represents parks, arts, community and civic life, and equity and human rights, all of which allow us to live, play, and work in this beautiful and abundant region. As we continue planning for a much needed reorganization mandated by voter approved charter reform, it's clear that we have a lot of work to do as a governing body and as a city. My team and I will be keeping the city's top priorities, homelessness, community safety, economic development, top of mind in this budget process. We look forward to hearing from all of you, the people of Portland, about your visions for this new form of government and how we can use our resources to ensure Portland remains a welcoming place for people from all walks of life to live, play, and work. And that is the Commissioner uh, Commissioner Ryan's statement. General, turn it back to you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mayor Wheeler. Uh, so it's my pleasure to continue our welcome um, to our third community listening session on the City of Portland's fiscal year 2023-2024 budget. Um, the purpose of gathering this morning is um, to hear from community members who will be providing testimony to the council um, on the issues that they want to see addressed in the city's upcoming budget. So just to give you an overview of our agenda today, I'm going to start by reading two statements, one on the electronic meetings um, statement, and then the second will be our rules of conduct for this morning. Um, and then following those statements, then we'll hear from some opening remarks from our other council members who are here in attendance today, and then switch over to hearing a budget 101 from budget director Tim Grew. Um, following those presentations, then we'll hear from invited community testimony, followed by community testimony on any topic. We want to make sure that there are, of course, always additional opportunities to hear from from folks. And so um, there are two more of these open community listening sessions. The next one will be on Thursday, May 11th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. That's the mayor's proposed budget hearing. And then following that, you will have on Wednesday, May 17th from 2 to 5, the approved budget hearing. If you want to provide testimony at any time, you can do so by going to the city's website, which is portlandoregon.gov slash CBO, uh, or you can email testimony directly to um, budget comment at portlandoregon.gov. So I'm just going to read two statements. The first is our electronics meeting statement. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. So all members of Council are attending remotely by video and teleconference. And the City has made several avenues available to the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. This meeting is available on the, to the public on the City's YouTube channel, eGovPDX also at portlandoregon.gov slash video and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to council on the budget at the budget office website, portlandoregon.gov slash CBO and by email at budget comment at portlandoregon.gov. Okay, next I wanna read our rules of conduct uh, for our meeting this morning. The city council represents all Portlanders and needs to do the city's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so that everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in this meeting, participants apply to give testimony online. So if you did not apply and you'd like to give testimony to council, submit that testimony in writing at portlandoregon.gov slash CBO. When testifying, please state your name for the record, but your address is not necessary. Declare if you are a lobbyist, um, and if you're representing an organization, please represent, please identify it. Everyone will have two minutes to testify and you'll be timed by staff. When your time's over, you'll be given um, a verbal reminder and then muted after two minutes and 30 seconds have passed so that we can make sure that we have time for as much participation as possible. Any disruptive conduct such as shouting or refusing to concede your testimony when your time's up or interrupting others' testimony will not be allowed today. So if there are any disruptions, a warning will be given that any further disruption may result in the person being muted or even ejected for the remainder of the electronic meeting. So please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. And thank you sincerely for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. 
So again, we're meeting here today because we want to hear from community members um, so that they can help inform decision makers um, and their thought process for this budget and future budget cycles. Um, so I want to go ahead and open it up to our other members of council to give some opening remarks. And so we'll just go in kind of our uh, voting order. And I can see uh, Commissioner Maps is, is ready to go. So I will hand it over to you. Um, thank you, everybody. Good morning. My name is Mengus Maps. I'm your commissioner in charge of public works bureaus like the Water Bureau, the Bureau of Environmental Services, and PBOT. My priorities for next year's budget include houselessness, public safety, livability, and economic recovery. This morning, I'm looking forward to hearing testimony on the priorities that are important to community members. So I appreciate everyone who showed up today to testify. And um, I want to thank everyone who's tuning in online to follow this important discussion. And with that, I will hand the floor back uh, either to staff or to Commissioner Rubio. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Carmen Rubio. I'm the Commissioner for Community and Economic Development. And this includes planning and sustainability housing development, um, development services, and Prosper Portland. And I wanna thank everyone for coming out today to uh, engage with us on our budget priorities and to share what's important to you. And at the end of the day, we all want a budget that reflects our shared values and priorities. Um, and just one, one of my big focuses is on the housing crisis and homelessness, um, both being of the utmost urgency. Um, and Portlanders have told us that very, very clearly. I'm also focused on having safe and strong communities and neighborhoods, including in North Portland, St. John's area, um, East Portland, and also the reinvigoration of our tourism and hospitality industries. Um, and also that small businesses are supported to get back on their feet. Um, all these things are indicators of, of, of a healthy um, community. And so these are the things that I'll be thinking about today. So we're eager to hear from you and to make sure that we're focusing on the right things and prioritizing things in the way that ma makes sense for Portlanders. So thanks again for uh, coming out today. Excellent. Thank you so much, Commissioners and Mayor Wheeler. Um, next, I want to hand it over to Budget Director Tim Grew to give us a Budget 101. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, Commissioners, and participants. My name is Tim Grew. And I am the city's budget director. I'm going to provide you with a very brief high level overview of the city's budget to help inform you and assist you in your engagement with the council today. First of all, it's sometimes confusing as to which jurisdiction provides what services. So I want to make clear that the city is not the only entity providing public services to Portlanders. We partner with other local and regional governments to provide and coordinate comprehensive services to our communities. The county, which for Portland includes Multnomah, Washington, and even Clark County, provides human and public health services, library services, the district attorney's office, and management of the jail, parole, and probation systems, as well as other services. TriMet provides bus, light rail, and commuter rail services in the greater Portland area. And Metro plans for the future of Portland, Portland's region, and provides parks, public venues, and services that cross city and county lines. Additionally, we have public school systems, which are important jurisdictional partners. Next slide. At the city, we organize bureaus in service areas, as pictured on this slide. The city's Bureau of Transportation manages traffic infrastructure, parking, the streetcar, and local, local roads. Public utilities, including the Bureau of Environmental Services, which provides sewer services, and the Water Bureau that provides the water that, that you have in your home, and public safety includes police, fire, 911, call taking, and emergency management services. Parks and Recreation, which is a single bureau, but has several functions and services, including parks, golf, community centers, swimming pools, and the Portland International Raceway. And then community development consists of the bureaus, which have several functions and services, including, excuse me, uh, sustain, which include the Bureau of Development Services, Planning and Sustainability, Office of Community and Civic Life, Housing, as well as expanding levels 
of services pertaining to homelessness. Finally, city support services include all the back office functions of the city to support frontline service providers, including my own organization that manages the budget system and process. Next slide. This chart shows the budget process. And as indicated in the green box, you can see that we're currently in the process of developing the mayor's proposed budget. So this listening session is important and timely as it provides you with an opportunity to directly inform the mayor and council members on the services and issues that are important to you as they formulate the budget. The mayor's proposed budget will be published on May 4th, followed by council deliberations and the approved budget. Next slide. This pie chart shows how the city's total $6.8 billion this year um, is divided amongst these, these service areas that I referenced previously. The budget includes both operating dollars for the day-to-day -day functions and activities of the city, as well as dollars to support multi-year needs such as capital infrastructure improvements. The largest service area is our public utilities, which is in black in the pie chart, followed by administration support. This is because these functions hold large multi-year capital and debt finance programs. So their total budget figures incorporate much more than just their annual operating budgets. Next slide. This chart shows the financial resources that support the city services and capital improvements. The beginning fund balance includes carryover of funds from the prior year, as well as the city's reserves and contingencies. Other key revenues include service charges and fees, like water and sewer, and sewer charges, intergovernmental grants, license and permits, such as business license permits. Next slide. Budget conversations and decisions often focus on what we call the general fund discretionary resources. These are resources that can be allocated by the council with few restrictions. However, of the total city budget, only about 10% is comprised of these discretionary resources. It's important to remember that. As we talk about general fund total discretionary allocations, we are only talking about a relatively small part of the city's budget. In addition to water and sewer service fees, dedicated resources also include grants, capital projects that are supported by bonds and other debt issuance, and dedicated tax levies, such as the children's levy and the parks levies. Next slide. The city's current adopted budget for general fund discretionary funds this year is $711 million. The chart shows how these resources are allocated among the city's service areas. The majority of general fund discretionary dollars are used to support public safety services, including police, fire and rescue, 911 call taking. The police bureau is the largest, has, has the largest allocation followed by fire and rescue. Additionally, the city spends a notable portion of its discretionary resources on parks and recreation and community development services, services including homeless services and planning services. At the beginning of the budget process, the city economists forecast the available general fund discretionary resources over a five year horizon. The December forecast showed growth of revenues exceeded forecasts by $6.5 million based on information available at that time. This means that the city began the budget on information available, excuse me, the city began the budget process with 6.5 million that can be allocated to improving current services or by adding new services and projects that address council priorities. Now 6.5 million sounds like a lot of money, but as you heard in the mayor's opening comments, the city is transitioning to, to a new form of government that's costing money. There are services that are, are council priorities such as homelessness that need to be funded. There's also one-time programs that have been funded in prior years that need to be continued into the next year. 
So this $6.5 million will be allocated very quickly as we go through the budget process. The ongoing one-time resources may change when the city updates its forecast toward the end of April. This chart shows what has already been suggested to you. To, for more information on the city's budget, I encourage you to visit the city's budget website at www.portlandoregon.gov-cbo. This is where you can find the budget documents, which will include the mayor's proposed budget once it is issued in May. We also welcome you welcome receiving emails from you pertaining to budget questions at city budget office at portlandoregon.gov. You may also visit the city's budget office website in order to share your thoughts in the city budget. Today is the last listening session on the budget. The next opportunity to participate will be the hearing on the mayor's proposed budget on Thursday, May 11th from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Additionally, you may submit test, online testimony by visiting the budget office website via Portland Maps website as listed on the slide, or you may email your comment to budget comment at portlandoregon.gov. All written testimony will be shared with the council. Thank you for listening to this presentation, and I will turn this back to Jen. Excellent. Thank you so much, Director Guru, for that uh, foundational bit of information. Um, next, we're going to move into our invited uh, community testimony. So the council office is connected with community members to ensure that we're hearing from a diversity of voices during these listening sessions. So our first testimony of this evening is dedicated to this invited testimony, uh, which will be followed by open testimony from the public. Um, Again, there'll be uh, just two minutes for testimony. A timekeeper will help time the, te the testimony. You'll see also a timer that will help give you a visual cue. Um, when you hear someone say time at two minutes, please go ahead and conclude your remarks. You'll also be given a reminder at two minutes and 10 seconds, two minutes and 20 seconds, and then anything beyond two minutes and 30 seconds, we'll just go ahead and, and mute you to make sure that we can hear from um, everyone who's been invited this evening or this morning. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Jeremiah, who's going to be announcing um, our next three speakers. Thanks, Jen. Uh, for the next three speakers, uh, I'm going to do four for the invited testimony. So we'll have Joy Jones, Dana Shepard, Nolan Dean Hart, and Alan Lupe in that order. And so first we'll hear from Joy Jones. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? We can't. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, Mayor Willer and commissioners. I'm glad to be here. I am Joy Jones, CEO of Transition Projects. I want to thank you for your commitment to ending homelessness and for your partnership in our work. Transition Projects provides shelter for up to 500 people a night. And from shelter, we moved last year of over 500 people into permanent housing. With your help, we've moved hundreds of households from streets into permanent supportive housing. Specifically, um, we also have our shelters. It includes the River District Navigation Center, an innovative partnership between Transition Projects, Oregon Harbor of Hope, the City of Portland, and the County. And it also includes the Willamette Center, a newly remodeled um, program shelter that will open up again in the fall where we serve 120 women and couples. These programs are vital to our community's response to ending homelessness, to keeping individuals and families off um, our streets. The programs have been embraced by the neighborhoods in which they are housed. They are assets to the city. Please continue to support these important programs as I begin um, my tenure um, here to lead this work. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Dana Shepard. Good morning, commissioners and mayor. My name is Dana Shepard. I'm the executive director of Portland Housing Center. Portland Housing Center is a HUD approved counseling agency, a CDFI, and also a mortgage broker. I appreciate the invite and the opportunity to be of influence to the city of Portland's budget priorities. First of all, I just wanna say thank you to Commissioner Rubio for your intentionality and your time commitment uh, to meeting with myself and other members of the Partners of Affordable Home Ownership. Uh, you've recognized homeownership as a pathway to build wealth. 
homeownership disparities for BIPOC households are prevalent and ongoing, and the gap, unfortunately, is widening. I just also want to acknowledge the efforts of the Portland Housing Bureau and their success with the creation of units through the Portland Housing Bonds. So PHC provides HUD counseling and education, support, financial literacy, culturally specific courses uh, for those hoping to become homeowners. So that is the position in which I approach the council today. Again, thank you. So I did a quick scan of the Portland Housing Center pipeline. There is about 1,300 folks that come in that register for our services year after year, and that has continued over the past three years, um, even through the pandemic. Uh, so the problem that we're seeing in creating home ownership is access. It's low inventory and no down payment assistance. It is not the absence of hope. Our housing counselors and other uh, partners within uh, the industry in our local community have helped people repair credit, pay down their debt, and remove collections, and wait out bankruptcies, for instance. So what we need here, we need a bold and intentional efforts for investments into home ownership. So especially for those that have been historically marginalized, those that have been disproportionately impacted by economic times. Thank you for your time, and I appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Next, we hear from Nolan Linhart. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioner Rubio, and Commissioner Maps, and Commissioner Gonzalez. Thank you for hosting this important listening session to discuss the city budget. While I'm sure every year presents challenging decisions around prioritizing limited resources, I know that the range of critical needs today make it impossible for you to allocate those resources in a way that will satisfy everyone. I've had more time than usual this year to share my thoughts as a member of the Advisory Committee for the Inclusive Economic Development Strategy, so I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in that process and reiterate that I'm fully supportive of the recommendations in that strategy, which I believe is now called Advance Portland. I also want to acknowledge that while my comments are focused on economic development and housing development, I support the Council's clear prioritizations of houselessness and public safety. In addition to those strategies and investments, I encourage Council to prioritize a broad range of support for both public and private economic development activities with an emphasis on responding to our challenges with creativity and flexibility. This means exploring innovative strategies and investments that promote adaptive reuse of commercial spaces through tenanting incentives and accelerated permitting. It means activating and revitalizing public spaces through events, pop-up retail, and street repurposing, and doing all that with an eye on promoting inclusive economic growth, uh, supporting minority businesses, and rebuilding the social fabric of our city. In addition, it's crucial to support housing production of all types. We're facing unique challenges in the coming years where large-scale development projects will likely struggle to find financing from traditional national funders. We should not assume that housing production will continue at the pace that it has in the last 10 years. We will need your help to keep the housing pipeline flowing to ensure stable rents and maintain construction employment opportunities in our city. Finally, a thriving city needs safe streets. During the COVID years, we've seen dramatically rising fatalities and I see that in my own neighborhood in Northeast Portland, as well as where I work downtown. Please support speed and red light cameras throughout the city, which will help to identify the most reckless drivers while maintaining dispropor uh, minimizing disproportionate interactions between law enforcement and minority communities. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, for our last invited testimony for this morning, we will have Alan Luca. Morning, everyone. My name is Alan Lubke, and I'm a resident. I live on Northeast 85th and Milton, which the Oregonian called Portland's deadliest block in an article about six months ago. Um, despite how many problems this neighborhood has with gun violence and crime, it's a neighborhood where the people who live here are heavily invested in the neighborhood. We have created our own farmer's market, the Rocky Butte Farmer's Market, our own thriving community garden, We've opened and operated two different restaurants um, right in our area. Every summer we paint murals in our intersections. We raise money for that. We get 50 to 100 people that come out and volunteer. 
We have twice um, monthly meetings where we meet at a local restaurant run by a local family and neighbors meet and we discuss the state of things and we work on plans for improvement. In the last year, we've also started collaborating closely with the city. I recognize a couple of people in this meeting um, to help deal with the crime in the neighborhood. So this is a neighborhood, despite its problems, it's people who are invested in solving the problems that we have. What we need now is we need additional law enforcement because the problems we're having with drugs and crime and prostitution are not things that we can solve on our own. And when the city invests into law enforcement in our neighborhood, we see improvements. We've seen that over the last year. We just need more of it. And I believe that when you invest public dollars into our neighborhood, you're gonna see an incredible return on investment because we're a group of people that are trying to bring up our neighborhood, not just for ourselves, but to attract additional in, um, commercial investment to bring good things to our neighborhood. And I believe that's what we want for Portland neighborhoods. We want people who are personally invested in their neighborhood. They're not just complaining. They're not just asking for help. They're doing the work. If you help us more, we're gonna be able to do, it, do even more. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much to all of our invited speakers. Um, for the next portion of our, our time this morning, we're going to hear open testimony from community members on any topic. Um, just as a quick reminder, um, everyone's testimony needs to be at two minutes, and so you'll see that visual timer. Um, you'll also be given a verbal reminder at two minutes, and, and then again at two minutes and 10 seconds, two minutes and 20, and then finally muted at two minutes and 30 seconds. Um, if you're joining us by phone, you can use star six to mute or to unmute. And so I'm going to hand it back to Jeremiah to uh, read our next three participants. Thank you, Jen. Our next three uh, testimonies for this morning would be Alex Ritlinger, Jennifer Parrish Taylor, and Mercedes Elizaldi. So we'll start with Alex Ritlinger. And then Alex, I can see you and I saw that you unmuted, but we weren't able to hear you. Do you wanna try it again? Uh, yes, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Rubio, Maps, and Gonzalez. For the record, my name is Alex Riedlinger. I'm here representing ERCO, uh, the Immigrant Refugee Community Organization as the Policy Advocacy Coordinator. Um, I have uh, led the, the ERCO Diversity and Civic Life Program on and off for four years with the goal of increasing community impact on public decision making. The Office of Community and Civic Life's requested budget proposes cutting the DCL program by 50%, devastating our organization's ability to provide leadership development opportunities. ERCO, Urban League, Native American Youth and Family Services, Unite Oregon, and Latino Network are grantees of the DCL program. So these cuts directly harm Black, Indigenous, communities of color, immigrants, refugees, migrants, people with disabilities, and LGBTQ2SIA plus folks. These reductions were the only cuts in Civic Life's proposed budget and move resources away from programs dedicated to BIPOC communities. Civic Life has called this act of reappropriation a strategic repurpose. I call it strategic racism. DCL partners were never informed of the proposed cuts and were denied an opportunity to provide feedback. This suggests a bad faith effort to communicate with our BIPOC communities and reinforces exclusionary practices within the city. Without the civic and leadership development programs that we provide, our community members will struggle to access civic spaces and build political agency for themselves. Consider this, you are representing intersectional community members, whether you consider them your constituents, whether they are denied voting rights, whether you publicly oppose the charter or not. But the people's historic decision to begin implementation of voting and governance changes, it is vital the city invest in civic leadership of BIPOC Portlanders. Approving these cuts will align council's budget priorities with further attempts to deny our communities the ability to participate in civil society. We call upon the Office of Civic Life and all city council members to immediately commit to the values of anti-racism and equity by restoring and increasing DCL funding. These funds should be in the base budget so the partnership is clear and sustained in future budget cycles. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Jennifer.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Jennifer Parrish Taylor. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy for the Urban League of Portland. The Department of Civic Life Grants Program has allowed me to be of service to a community that has contributed so much to who I am today. It's one of the few avenues by which those who can afford to spend a Saturday speaking to the importance of this grant program have a voice. As someone who grew up in inner Northeast and has witnessed up close the decimation of my community because of gentrification, the importance and need for our community to come together to effectuate change can be life-saving. In the almost two years that I've been in this role, I've witnessed firsthand the impact of civic engagement on the city, but more importantly, our communities. For example, through the programs that we run at the League in concert and in partnership with the other community-based and culturally specific organizations who receive funding, our community has been able to advocate for changes in the city governing structure, has voiced their very real and valid concerns with mass encampments of our homeless neighbors, stressed the importance of growing our access to affordable housing, chimed in on prior budgets, and the list goes on. Lastly, DCL was born out of the desire for some level of equity, both in policymaking, but also the financial decisions made by this body. To propose effectively gutting this program would forever change our ability to do this work successfully and it roll back the progress we've made to date. We urge you to reconsider this budget proposal. Thank you so much. Thank you. And next we hear from Mercedes. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and Commissioners. My name is Mercedes Elizalde, and I am the Director of Advocacy at Latino Network. Right now, my colleague is running a training session with 18 participants in the Academica de Vidras program, which is funded by the Office of Civil Life Div Div Diversity Civic Leadership Program. They meet every two weeks on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. for six months. These trainings are offered in Spanish, provide childcare, food, assistance with transportation when they are in person, and assistance with technology when they are remote. This Saturday, they are meeting in person with local elected officials who are providing a presentation in Spanish to help folks understand how to vote, how to run for office, and how to engage with their elected officials at the local, state, and federal level. They are building confidence in using their voice to advocate for their community, and they're building an understanding for what it takes to participate in what can be complicated systems, particularly for new Americans. They are building lifelong relationships that will result in ongoing volunteerism and connection. Their sessions include things like characteristics of great leaders, leadership styles and communication strategies, government structures, civic engagement, popular education, and on and on. These programs in most communities would be desperate to have and proud to have. Unfortunately, the Office of Civil, Civic Life has signaled a change in how they value the work of civic engagement and civic education and recently recommended this program be cut by 50%. The Diversity Leadership, Civic Leadership Program and the Civic Engagement and Civic Education is building a small network of culturally specific providers who you have heard from here. And with the coming charter changes, these are the kinds of investments that we should be valuing more than ever, not less. Just a few days ago, the city council members shared their own concerns and expressed confusion about the new system. So now seems like a very bad time to be cutting programs that are able to help educate people on how to participate and understand the new system. These are small but mighty programs. It would take only $750,000 to fully fund them. We ask that you restore the proposed cut of $375,000 to have a fully funded program. While the Office of Civic Life may be wavering in their commitment to civic engagement, I sincerely hope and ask that the mayor and council remain committed to this work, reject the department's proposal, and fully fund the program. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Our next three testimonies this morning would be by Rhea Hannon. Tony DeFalco and Wendy Rahm. We'll start off by hearing from Rhea. Rhea, are you able to unmute? Okay, maybe, uh, Rhea, maybe let's move to our next uh, testimony and then we'll make sure that you have an opportunity um, to, to join us after our next testimony. Sounds good. So, we'll hear, we'll great, hear from uh, Tony, Tony DeFalco. Good morning, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. It's good to be with you. It's always an honor and privilege to have the opportunity to present with, to you today. My name is Tony DeFalco. I use he, him, L pronouns. 
I currently serve as the executive director at Latino Network, and I also serve as the chair of the board of the Coalition of Communities of Color. I wanted to share with you three important points. You heard from my colleague, Mercedes Elizalde earlier about the importance of restoring the proposed cut to the diverse, uh, diversity civic leadership program. I won't spend much more time there other than to echo her sentiments about the importance of that program in this particular time. I want to share with you the importance of doubling down on investments in communities of color as we approach the end of the pandemic. Our communities are not out of the woods yet. We continue to suffer the impacts of the pandemic and we continue to be the slowest to recover from the pandemic economically, socially, educationally, and in public safety. These are not byproducts of an accident of the pandemic. These are systemic uh, things that happen every time there is a crisis in our country. We strongly oppose the proposed cut to the Reimagine Oregon program. This is exactly the wrong time to cut investments to communities of color. We also would note that with respect to the Office of Violence Prevention, lots of departments in the city have trouble getting money out to the community. We ourselves have seen this in delays in grant agreements, delays in contracting, and that means that we need to double down as a city and working together to make partnerships work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Wendy Rom. Good morning. My name is Wendy Rom. Uh, first, I want to thank the commissioners for unanimously approving the ordinance that called for the Thompson Elk Fountain to be restored and put back where it was in the middle of Main Street. And special thanks also to their staffs who have been working tirelessly on this complicated project with the Concerned Citizens Group. With so many problems facing you, it is easy to overlook something like this restoration, which will be so meaningful for all of us. But as we all know, that much anticipated action won't happen without serious money in the FY 23-24 budget cycle. Many private citizens are making donations to a Parks Foundation effort to cover some of the initial costs, which I'm sure you know about, but those donations are contingent and will only be given if the remaining public money is included in this budget. We urge you to vote to include this money so the Elk Fountain can once again greet people to our downtown. Portland has been gaining a reputation of being the city of pedestals, which is a terrible metaphor for us all. Please know that the time is now to address the restoration of important works of public art that were vandalized three years ago. Please don't let the vandals determine our policies. Prioritizing the Elk Fountain will be an important symbol for all Portlanders that the commission is leading the revitalization of downtown. Thank you so much for all your work and for letting me speak, thanks. Thank you. Um, Rhea, would, are you able to unmute at this point? But it looks like we've lost Rhea, but we will um, be keeping an eye out just in case um, that they are able to, to rejoin this meeting. Perfect. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so we'll go to our next two testimonies. We'll have Rod Merrick and Virginia Ellaby. Um, we'll start with Rod Merrick. Great, Rod, I saw you join. If you're able to unmute, we would love to hear your testimony. So um, for some reason it spins around and, and has to reinsert me, but um, I just wanna thank you for um, hearing our testimony again. Um, and uh, my name is Rod Merrick, as, as was just announced. Uh, the restoration of the Thompson Elk Fountain 
is one of several signals, symbolic and tangible, that the downtown economy is on the mend and council is leading. It appears the council is committed to move forward despite the competing priorities. The seemingly high price is a shared concern, but the damage from repeated nightly fires was severe and the stakes for economic stability and recovery are high. Significant private funding has been committed to completing construction documents. With construction bids in hand, leverage to collect insurance reimbursement will be in place. Sufficient contingencies are built into the budget so that it's reasonable to expect some, if not significant savings. But the budget commitment at this point is essential. The city has been missing the Elk Fountain for three years. The time has come to say no to vandalism and yes to a revitalized central city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Virginia, over to you. Good morning, Commissioners and Mayor Wheeler. My name is Virginia Ellaby. I'm here today to urge the City Council to boost parks major maintenance funding to prevent worsening of the Bureau's nearly $600 million backlog. This is an unusual request because it essentially asks the Council to direct PPNR to dedicate a portion of its general fund discretionary allocation to major maintenance projects. The CBO's review of this year's parks budget says the council has the right to take such action. I am not, however, asking that this approach be used to revamp the budget currently under discussion. Instead, I would like to see the council use this option to ramp up parks major maintenance outlays starting in fiscal year 2025. In the interest of time, I will not detail why such reallocation is important now. I will, however, submit written testimony that addresses this question. I believe Commissioner Ryan and his parks team should lead any council discussions regarding reallocating spending. Insights from these individuals will be crucial in identifying general fund discretionary resources that can be reallocated without compromising the Bureau's ability to carry out its core mission or undercutting the Bureau's pledge to use levy proceeds to prevent ongoing reductions to park services and programs, preserve park and natural area health, and center equity and affordable access for all. Finally, PPR is in the best position to compile the material the Council will need to reallocate resources effectively. Such things as an easy, easy to digest tally of the $600 million backlog, and the Bureau's current plan and time for tracking it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That was the last of our open testimonies. However, I do see Rhea back in the attendees list. Rhea, would you be able to uh, join us and unmute? Yeah, I, we're still not able to hear you. I wonder, um, I, I want to give enough time to, to hear all the testimony, but if, if we're not able to hear it, again, we want to make sure that there are other opportunities for folks to um, provide testimony online via email and then at our next um, mayor proposed budget session. Okay, and so um, with that, I'll just go ahead and move us on to our council closing remarks. Um, and I would love if we could start in voting order with um, Commissioner Gonzalez. Just wanna thank all the participants today for your engagement in this important public work. Uh, it's a difficult budget cycle, a difficult time in the city. There are gonna be some tough choices, but your participation in this process is much, much appreciated. Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Terrific. Next, we'll hear from Commissioner Maps. Uh, yes, I want to thank everyone who testified this morning. Um, this morning, I heard concerns about 
homelessness, home ownership, economic development, traffic safety, public safety, cuts to DCLs, uh, the Elk Fountain, and park maintenance. I share these concerns too, and I look forward to working with members of the public and my colleagues to build a budget which reflects Portland values. Uh, thanks to everyone who uh, participated today or is watching online. Uh, these discussions around the budget will continue for several weeks, and I encourage you to stay engaged. And with that, I will hand the floor back to Commissioner Rubio. Thanks everyone who testified today. I especially want to thank Dana Shepard and Nolan Leinhart with uh, ZGF and Portland Housing Center uh, for joining us as invited testimony. Um, I also uh, really appreciate that everyone turned out on a Saturday to say things that are important to them and what they, they see reflected in this budget. Um, themes that were very resonant for me um, that I heard were issues of livability, community building, housing, um, particularly investing in housing development and ownership programs, uh, park maintenance, and also investing in neighborhoods that are wanting to be part of the solution um, around community safety. Um, also why it's critical to restore DCL leadership programs to strengthen engagement of BIPOC communities uh, to government. Um, and it's something I deeply support and I've seen firsthand both as a staff when it was first funded uh, by Mayor Potter and then as a nonprofit director running a program. Um, I also heard the need to support safe communities, um, support for small businesses and the goals all outlined in the inclusive um, economic development strategy and the need to double down on all our investments that strengthen rather than reduce um, our connection uh, among BIPOC and disenfranchised communities to civic participation during this critical re recovery time. Um, these are all really important things um, and these will be at the top of my mind. And um, um, we will make sure that these things also continue to shape the work of the budget moving forward. So thanks again for everybody for turning out. Excellent. Thank you, Commissioners. Next, we'll move to um, hear closing remarks from Mayor Wheeler. Yeah, I'll be brief. First of all, uh, again, like my colleagues, I want to thank everybody for showing up on a Saturday morning. That's tough duty, and I really appreciate people's willingness to do that. Uh, we heard some consistent themes, as my colleagues had identified. Uh, the next step of the budget is the hard part for me. It's the proposed budget, meaning I have to stand alone and show the priorities that I'm investing in and of necessity, uh, there are many more requests from our resources than we have resources. And so there'll be some very tough choices that are worked into the proposed budget. I'll be very clear that my priorities are those priorities that were previously identified by the council as our council-wide priorities, homelessness, public safety, livability-related issues, and economic recovery. And the proposed budget will reflect those priorities. And uh, I just want to, to also say the city of Portland does some things that no other government does around safety, around livability issues, around uh, the maintenance and upkeep of infrastructure, parks, and, and many other areas. And we have to be good in those service areas where there are no other governments that have responsibility because we're the only ones who do. And, and so my uh, budget will also reflect that reality. Finally, on top of all of the crisis we've, crises we've been experiencing, we are on a fast track to completely reinvent city government between now and January 1st, 2025. That requires substantial investment in order uh, to, to make uh, that transition a smooth and effective one. There are no designated sources of funding for any of that. So all of that is general fund resource that's competing directly head to head with some of our other core services. Uh, but the transition to the new form of government is not optional. So it flows right to the top of the budget as a priority. So I just want people to uh, hear me when I say the city of Portland cannot afford to be all things to all people all of the time. We have to make tough choices. And uh, it's my job as mayor to take the first cut at those tough choices. And uh, I just want you to be aware of that. But I have heard the testimony today, and I appreciate everybody's engagement and input in this process. Uh, thank you.
Jen, I'll turn this back over to you to close this out and talk a little bit about next steps. Great. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. And thank you again to all of our participants um, and everyone who offered testimony today. I really appreciate your time. Um, just again, to reiterate, this is not the last opportunity to um, have your voice heard and to comment on the budget. We're going to have two upcoming budget listing sessions and hearings. The next one is Thursday, May 11th from 6.30 to 8.30. That's the mayor's proposed budget hearing. Um, and then Wednesday, May 17th from 2 to 5 p.m. will be the approved budget hearing testimony. Um, again, at any time, if you want to provide testimony, you can do so online at portlandoregon.gov slash CBO, or you can email testimony to budget comment at portlandoregon.gov, and all of that testimony gets forwarded to council offices. And so with that, I will toss it back to you, Mayor Wheeler, to officially adjourn, adjourn this meeting today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll see you next time. We are adjourned. Thank you. Recording stopped. Thank you. Take care.